A person who thinks all the time has nothing to think about except thoughts. So he loses touch with reality and lives in a world of illusions. By thoughts I mean specifically chatter in the skull, perpetual and compulsive repetition of words, of reckoning and calculating. I'm not saying that thinking is bad. Like everything else, it's useful in moderation. A good servant, but a bad master. And all so-called civilized peoples have increasingly become crazy and self-destructive because through excessive thinking they have lost touch with reality. That's to say, we confuse signs, words, numbers, symbols and ideas with the real world. Most of us would have rather money than tangible wealth and a great occasion is somehow spoiled for us unless photographed. And to read about it the next day in the newspaper is oddly more fun for us than the original event. This is a disaster. For as a result of confusing the real world of nature with mere signs, such as bank balances and contracts, we are destroying nature. We are so tied up in our minds that we've lost our senses. Time to wake up. What is reality? Obviously, no one can say because it isn't words. It isn't material, that's just an idea. It isn't spiritual. That's also an idea, a symbol. Reality is this. Realize that anybody whom you consider in matters spiritual, psychological, and so on, has an authority. Has this authority because of your opinion that he has, or she has? How do you know? If you say, for example, like a Protestant fundamentalist, that you believe in the Bible, that the Bible is inspired. Or you may say, as a more liberal kind of Christian, that Jesus Christ is the greatest being that ever lived on earth. How do you know? It's your opinion that that is so. Lots of people may have told you so, and you may be very impressed by those people, but you bought it. And so, therefore, if you say, well, I would like to become like that, that's an expression of the way you are. You couldn't feel, I would like to become like that, like the authority, like the Christ, except as an expression of the way you are now. And the way you are now is the quaking mess. And therefore, your emulation, your desire, your idealism to become like Christ is merely one of the appetites of your quaking mess. It's an expression of you as you are. And don't fool yourselves. I'm not trying to put you down by talking about the quaking mess. The quaking mess may be in fact something very, very natural. The way we are, the state of affairs, and we shouldn't be ashamed of it. <laughs> I'm not ashamed of it. I told you all it's frantic. <laughs> but it is important not to fool oneself about this. 
But there does, doesn't there, seem to remain a problem about existence, about being alive. Now let's go into what is that problem at the sort of nitty-gritty level. Very basic in our thinking is that we, as it say, one must live. We need to survive, to go on. We need, therefore, money for food, for this, that and the other. We must go on. And we know that we're not going to get away with it for very long. That after a certain number of years we're going to die. The, the, the thing is going to end. The thing that we call I is going to be as it is in sleep. Deep sleep with no dreams. But that between now and that happening, there may be the most ghastly pains. Not only perhaps the pains of physical disease or being wounded or hurt, but the pains of worrying about our failure of responsibility to people who depend on us. And we suffer other people's suffering simply because we're sensitive and have imagination and participate in their sufferings and our adrenaline and our chemicals respond simply by imagination to the sufferings of other people and what about that and so we can look at these problems and say now quite obviously all these problems cannot be solved in a physical way that is to say we do not expect in our lifetime that medical skill will make us exempt from death. We do not seriously expect that human beings will all learn to be nice to each other and will refrain from war and horrors of that kind, racial prejudice and so on. We don't seriously expect to find a method of being protected by taking some sort of drug against all possible disease and pain. So therefore we say, now maybe there's another way around. Maybe that instead of solving these problems at the technical level, we could solve them at the psychological and spiritual level by so disciplining ourselves, by so doing something with ourselves, that we wouldn't be afraid of it anymore. And so, in accord with that motivation, we seek out spiritual teachers, psychological teachers, this, that and the other. Could we somehow be made over so that we don't worry about the quaking mess by a spiritual discipline or whatever. <clears throat> and you see if you examine that, that this wanting to overcome the quaking mess and not have it anymore, that precisely is the quaking mess. The thing that we object to about ourselves is precisely what we do about overcoming it. In other words, the activity that we employ in overcoming it is the mess that we object to. Do you see that? And it's very important to realize that. And if you do realize it, you raise the question, then what can I do? What can I do to transform the quaking mess into the state of mind of the true mystic? Well, if you are the quaking mess, there is obviously nothing you can do 
to transform yourself into the state of mind which you idealize as that of being the true mystic, the Christ, the saint, or whatever. So you realize that uh, everything is phony, that uh, all your ideals are simply manifestations of the quaking mess trying to get away from itself. And that you are put in the position of it is absolutely necessary for me to be different from the way I am. But there's absolutely nothing I can do about it because being the way I am, I cannot be different from that. Let's say this, but if we can put it in different ways. I know that I ought not to be selfish. And I would very much like to be an unselfish person. But the reason why I want to be an unselfish person is that I am very selfish and would far more love myself and respect myself if I were unselfish. You see? I know that I ought to love God. And... Uh, whatever and why do you want to love God well because God is the biggest boss and it's best to be on the side of the big battalions <laughs> that's really why I want to do it in other words because I'm looking for the safety of my own spiritual skin so I think I ought to love God all oh, sophisticated saints have known this St. Paul understood it St. Augustine understood it Martin Luther understood it they didn't know what the hell to do about it. But there was nothing to do about it. And yet something has to be done. Obviously. But you realize when you really look into yourself, there's nothing you can do. And this, therefore, is our point of departure. That we here, perhaps, perhaps not, mutually realize there is nothing we can do to be anything else than what we are. To feel any other way than what we feel at this moment. and to be then this quaking mess which has the capacity for the horrors about what life can do to us. However, this isn't as much of a blind alley, a cul-de-sac, as it sounds. Because if you discover a blind alley, it tells you something. Watch the flow of water when it crosses over an area of land and you will see that it puts out fingers and some of them stop because they come into blind alleys. The water doesn't pursue that course. It simply rises and then it finds a way it can go. But it never uses any effort. It only uses weight, gravity. It takes the line of least resistance and eventually finds a course. Now we will do the same thing. Only we're ashamed of it. But we're going to do it anyhow. We think that when we come to a dead end, a blind alley, oh, I failed. Supposing the water, at each place where a finger of water stretches out over dry ground and doesn't go any further because the land is too high, the water were to say to itself, I failed. We would say it was neurotic water. <laughs> <laughs> Just wait and it will find a way. 
now when you find you see that there's, there's this predicament that I've been describing to you that there's no way of transforming yourself to become this fearless joyous divine being as distinct from the quaking mass when you says no way this is not a gloomy announcement it is a very very important communication it's telling you something because the like the land is telling the water this isn't the way to go there's another way try over here so in the same way life is telling you that's not the way to go It's telling you, the, the, the message underlying this is you cannot transform yourself, is giving you the message that the you that you imagine to be capable of transforming yourself doesn't exist. In other words, an ego, an I, separate from my emotions, my thoughts, my feelings, my experiences, who is supposed to be in control of them, cannot control them because it isn't there. And as soon as you understand that, things will be vastly improved. Now, we can go into this. What do you mean by the word I? We're going to make some experiments in this on some number of different levels, but in the ordinary way, what do you mean by the word I? I myself. Your personality, your ego, what is it? Well, first of all, obviously, it's your image of yourself. It's composed of what people have told you about yourself, who you are, how they've reacted to you and given you an impression that that's the sort of person you are. It's all your education goes into this, the style of life you put on and so forth. But, you, but it's an image, it's an idea, it's your thought about yourself and I suppose yourself is in fact not this, but is to begin with, your total physical organism, your psychological organism, and beyond that, an organism doesn't exist as a, an isolated thing any more than a flower exists without a stalk, without roots, without earth. So in the same way, although we are not stalked on the ground, we are nevertheless inseparable from a huge social context of, well, to begin with, parents, siblings, people who work for us, and everything. I mean, it's, it's just impossible to cut ourselves off from a social environment and also, furthermore, from a natural environment. We are that. There's no clear way of drawing the boundary between this organism and everything that surrounds it. And yet, the image of ourselves that we have does not include all those relationships. Our idea of personality of ourselves includes no information whatsoever about the hypothalamus, an organ of the brain, the pineal gland, really of the way we breathe of how our blood circulates, of how we manage to form a sentence, how we manage to be conscious, how you open and close your hand. The information contained in your image of yourself contains nothing about all that, 
And therefore, obviously, it's an extremely inadequate image. But nonetheless, we do think that the image of self refers to something. Because we, we have the impression, very strongly indeed, that I exist. And this isn't just an idea we think, my God, it's a feeling. It's, it's really substantially there in the middle of us. And what is it? What, what, what do you actually sense? Like, you know, when you're sitting on the floor and you feel the floor is there and is real and hard. Okay, what are you sitting on the floor? What, what do you have the sensation of? You know, that's you here. When you're not hitting yourself. Huh. What is it? Well, in what part of your body do you feel yourself? The real I existing. We can explore this very deeply, but I'm going to give you a preliminary and superficial answer. The, the sensation which corresponds to the image of ourselves is a chronic muscular tension. Which has absolutely no useful function whatsoever. It is when you try, say, to concentrate. What do you do when you try to pay attention? When I was a little boy in school, I had sitting next to me another boy who had great difficulty in reading. And as he worked over the textbook with its perfectly piffling information, he groaned and grunted to try to read, to get out the sounds, as if he were heaving enormous weights with his muscles. You know, spot. Run! 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 The teacher was vaguely impressed that he was trying. <laughs> Phew! It had absolutely, you know, all this tying yourself up into a knot has absolutely nothing to do with the way your mind works. Because, look, if you try to see hard, you know, look very intensely, and you make tight muscles around here, and maybe you clench your jaws a bit, if anything, that will make your vision more fuzzy. Because if you want to see something clearly, you must not make an effort. You must simply trust your eyes and your nervous system to do their thing. So you just look like that. I was writing the other night and I completely forgot somebody's name. But I knew that eventually my memory would produce it. And I just sat for a while and said to my memory, you know very well who this person is. Please give me the answer. And so, boing, there it was. <laughs> <laughs> because that's the way nerves work. They don't work by forcing them. And yet we've all been brought up to try to force our nervous activity, our concentration, our memory, our comprehension, and indeed our very love, we've tried to force it with muscles. Men will understand me if I say, you cannot force by muscular effort yourself to have an erection. Women will understand me if I say, 
You cannot force yourself with muscles to have an orgasm. It has to happen. And you must trust it to happen. And there is absolutely nothing you can do about it by using your muscles. Nothing, nothing, nothing. So in precisely the same way. Well, let, let's complete the picture. So therefore, the, the notion that we have of ourselves, of ego, is a compound of an image of ourselves which does not fit the facts and a sensation of muscular straining which is futile. So that what you conceive to be yourself is the marriage of an illusion and a futility. <laughs> so, well, what are we? If that isn't the case. Well, obviously, uh, if you want to take a scientific point of view by that mythology, then your, your organism, about which we know very little, and the organism, as we've seen, is inseparable from its environment, and so you are the organism environment. In other words, you are no less than the universe. Each one of you is the universe expressed in the place which you feel is here and now. You're an aperture through which the universe is looking at itself, exploring itself. And we're going to go into that much more deeply. So when you feel that you are a lonely put upon isolated little stranger confronting all this see you have an illusory feeling because the truth is the reverse you are the whole works that there is, that always was and always has been, always will be. Only, just as my whole body has a little nerve end here, which is exploring and which contributes to the sense of touch, you are just such a little nerve end for everything that's going on. Just as the eyes serve the whole body, and help it to find its way around, so you are, as it were, serving the whole universe. You're a cell in it. And it's exploring itself. So that you as a function, you, you are a function of all that. And therefore, if this is so, it just doesn't fit the... the these facts do not fit the way we feel. because we feel it the other way around. I am a little lonely thing exploring all this universe and trying to get make something out of it, get something out of it, do something with it. And I know I'm going to fail because I know I'm going to die one day. So we're all fundamentally depressed. And think up all these fantasies about what's going to happen to us when we're dead and all that kind of thing. Uh, what's going to happen to you when you're dead? What do you mean you? If you are basically the universe, that question is irrelevant. You never were born and you never will die. Because what there is, is you. And that should be absolutely obvious. But it is not obvious at all. That should be the simplest thing in the world. That you, the I, is what has always been going on and always will go on forever and ever. But we have been bamboozled by religionists, by politicians, by fathers and mothers, by all sorts of people to tell us you're not it. 
we believed it. So, do you see now why, if I put it to you in this very negative way, you can't do anything to change yourselves, to become better, to become happier, to become more serene, to become mystics or anything. If I say you can't do a damn thing, can you understand this negative statement in a positive way? What I'm really saying is that you don't need to. Because if you see yourselves in the correct way, you are all as much extraordinary phenomena of nature as, say, trees, clouds, the patterns in running water, the shape of fire, the arrangement of the stars, the form of a galaxy. You are all just like that. 